This podcast is brought to you by the Association for Coaching, the world's leading international professional body, which is advancing coaching in business and society worldwide. I'm your host, Sheila Hobden, and I am an executive coach and research practitioner. And in this new series, I'm delighted to introduce you to fellow coaches and researchers who share my passion for the transformative potential of research in coaching. Through curious conversations and practical insights, this series aims to inspire coaches to embrace evidence-based practices and enrich their professional journey. Hi, everyone. I am Sheila Hogden. I am a coach, supervisor, mentor coach, and most importantly, in the context of today, a practitioner researcher. And by that, I mean I am a coach practitioner who is engaged in research as opposed to a purely academic researcher and I am delighted to be hosting this series on research in coaching on behalf of the association for coaching and don't mind admitting that it's my first ever hosting of a podcast I've got a little bit of nervousness happening around me but I'm going to interpret it as excitement because I have I'm really excited about this podcast I'm really happy to introduce Tinder Erdos if you'd like to say hello welcome Tinder yeah, hello. Good afternoon from Austria, Sheila. <laughs> and so Tunda is an award-winning executive coach, also a supervisor, a mental coach and researcher. Uh, in fact, I'm really happy that Tunda is my first guest because Tunda is where my journey into research in coaching began back in 2018 when I took part in some research that you were leading and so the idea of this series is to inspire to move coaches to pay attention to research either whether it's using it integrating it into your practice whether it's taking part and benefiting from the learning that comes of that maybe even leading your own research someday and today as I talk with Tinder who I, I say shares this passion maybe inspired the passion in me so then we're kind of sharing it between ourselves now um and so there will be lots for us to talk about today uh Tinda is supervising my research project that's live right now and I was thinking when I was um invited to do this series that as a supervisor of coaching research there must be a lot of things that you see, not only in the outcomes of the research that people are leading, but what's happening in people's lives and in their coaching practice uh, as a result of undertaking research. So so what, what made you say yes when I said, would you like to come on to this podcast? <laughs> So first of all, I would like to welcome both your nervousness and excitedness, okay? <laughs> Thank you. The, the, the both the both nesses, yeah, the nervousness and the, <laughs> the excitement I wanted to say actually. Um, Sheila, I would definitely say yes to this because because we have been sharing this relationship and I was so grateful when you came on board of my research and you felt inspired. And it was so good to see that you not just participated, but then kind of like had your own learning through this, through the whole process, and then felt like inspired to do your own stuff. And then we have been sharing this. And through the sharing, I I feel like I care. I care like uh, what you care about. So that's why I'm here. Yeah. And that caring, do you care about research, don't you? Like, it's important. What makes it so important to you? If we just keep it between the two of us is like, because I was just saying that I care about you and stuff. I also care about research because I care about the person behind it. So I think that whenever we do research is there is also somebody doing it. So it's not research happening. There is also some, always somebody creating it. And I think this is something that I, I have never heard a lot of talk about this, how important it is to see the person behind the research. We talk about research a lot, yeah, but we are not talking about, hey, how does it come about, how it's created, what's going on, uh, which is also part of the research. 
So for me, it's important to mention this, for example, between, between us, that your research project matters, the topic matters to me, but basically it's not separable from who you are and, and, and your interests and why it's driving you to, to research what you are researching with, uh, which is well-being, yeah, and resilience uh, through workplace coaching. So um, that's the first thing that comes to my mind when, when you ask me about what is important for me. I think the person is very important and it, the person always shapes um, whatever is happening. And, and we call it ex- actually a researcher bias. Yeah. And it's not something that I view negatively or something that we should do without. And it, 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 it should be uh, eliminated, but quite on the contrary, it's something that we should integrate more. You know, like this is, yeah, the, the person is part of the, the topic and the topic is part, becomes part of the person. And, and there is a dance between the two. Like in coaching, there is a dance between the coach topic, the people, the, the space. Yeah. So to, to embrace it and integrate it better, uh, more meaningfully. Yeah. And that integration is making me think about, as you know, I write a newsletter for my research and each time it comes around to write it, it feels like this pressure that I've put on myself and I'm frequently writing about. So my topic is looking at the impact of workplace coaching on resilience and well-being. And I'm always conscious that I don't want to burn myself out running a research project on resilience and well-being. <laughs> the reality is that I've, I've got a life and I've got a business and uh, and I'm doing the research project. So there is something about where's that intersection of life and the person that's running the research, mm. what, what happens? I mean, what's your own experience been mm. in that space? Oh, yes, I totally see where you're coming from. And that's probably why I'm mentioning why it's so important for me, because when I was this core element in, in conducting the research, I I not just had the, the feeling that there was, I was creating knowledge, you know, something's being created there, but... I could really see how the whole process of being engaged with the people, the cohort, the the university, everything, you know, everything, my supervisors, like that whole process has transformed me. Yeah. So it's it was not just about, okay, I'm researching and then there is knowledge out there, data out there. And then we'll, we will discuss what it means for our practice. No, it was really about me. And that got me so excited because like, wow, that's what research can do. Like, this is the power of research. It can transform me as a person in a way that, in a way as, as a coach education can. Yeah. And it had shaped me and transformed me in many ways. It, it, I have become more ethical. For example, I, 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 I thought I was ethical until. I found out that I wasn't really <laughs> because there were so many things to that I, I wasn't aware of before. So this the very fact that noticing how I am expanding my perspective about, ah, oh, this is ethics. So ethics is not just about like well, how I contract with client, but oh, it's a lot more. This alone has has grown me, has, has grown the practitioner in me. Okay. Another thing that that was transformational for me was dealing with pain. Dealing with pain and how to deal with pain. I thought I was strong before I did the research. I thought I could cope. I thought I was independent. I thought I could I could do everything until I found out that I couldn't. Because because doing research also involved my context, my social environment, more specifically my family. And although I had contracted with my family very well that I, I would like to do a, a proper research, like process research, which is not just about doing a survey, and I'm not undermining the value of surveys, but I wanted to do process research, which means it takes more time, it's more effort, it's bigger, it's larger, it involves more people. And although I had contracted that with my family, way into the research, I found that my husband was leaving me because I was not available anymore. <laughs> so just knowing that I would be doing it and him saying yes to this, that was not sufficient to cope with it, you know, neither for him nor for me. So, and how to deal with this? What to do with the research? Will I stop now? Will I, will I stay on track? And if so, how? 
and what will happen to the relationship? How will we gonna cope with that and deal with it? Those were questions that really transformed me. And I really learned to be resilient through this. I really learned like, ah, okay. So I might be very passionate about something. And we keep saying like, we need to be passionate about something to have success, the real success, true success, et cetera. But then it also comes at a price, quote unquote, price. So me, you might call it price. We might call it a consequence. We might call it whatever we want to call it. But there is a shadow side to, to that as well, to the big light, yeah, to the big light of passion. And, and by the way, in the word passion, the passion of Christ, so in, in, in Christian religion, it also means suffering. So there is, it's not just happy moments. Passion doesn't just mean I'm, I'm happy because whatever we are passionate about also means that we may suffer because we are so attached to that. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that was very transformational in how I learned to deal with that pain, how to repair the relationship, how to stay on track with, with what I cared about. Yeah. What I was passionate about. And those are new, new dimensions of, of being and, and doing and learning. And that very much informed my practice also. So that's my experience. Wow. <laughs> There's so much there. And I've had my own life challenges as this research has been going on. And I think for me, that light and shadow is significant as well as how much energy I've been able to put in at various points. And I've had to make decisions about, um, okay, well, for now, I'll just put the minimum. I, I know I want to continue this. I don't want to stop. So I'll just have to adjust how much energy and attention I'm giving it and balance that with everything else. And those lessons about balance and like you say, you know, how to repair the relationship so that you can carry that on. It, it supports you with lots of, lots of lessons. So what is your philosophy around research, given all of that that you've just shared? Mm. Philosophy. You know, the word philosophy, <laughs> I'm, I'm smiling and laughing at the same time because it reminds me of many times that I was confronted with me being very philosophical. <laughs> People telling me, well, Tinder, you know what you're saying is very philosophical. And I said, okay, but you know, guys, you know what philosophy actually means? Philosophy means mindset. So what's wrong with mindset? The whole coaching business is about mindset and which mindset we apply to which situation to, to thrive. Yeah. So when you were asking me, so what is the philosophy about coaching for you? I thought like, wait, so maybe it's about mindset, maybe too. I would like to rephrase it into, into mindset. What is the attitude, the mindset, the, the approach that I, I like taking to, to research and call it philosophy. So those that like the word philosophy and, and are into philosophy, uh, they may use philosophy and those who prefer mindset, a more tangible thing than a mindset. I think for me, the mindset is openness. Openness in its real radical sense. Uh, and that means being open, not just to saying, oh, yes, I, I'm interested in what was found, but being open to the value that research can deliver. Yeah. The way we coaches are open to our clients. So we practice this curiosity, the unconditional positive regard, as Gestaltists would say. Yeah. So like, I, I take a look and I, I, I discover it and I learn about it and I immerse in it and I engage with it and I integrate it in my practice. And potentially if I feel passionate about a topic, because that's the next thing, when to do research and when not to do research, right? So to look into these elements and, and, and inquire, like, am I really open to research? Do I have my biases? Do I dub it like this is knowledge? It's, 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 you know, it's philosophy. It's, it's, it's knowledge is dry. It's brainy. Yeah. <laughs> or can we also apply the same level of curiosity and openness that we are ready to apply to our coaching practice in terms of when we are dealing and coaching towards our clients? Because that's what I'm not seeing that much in as a practitioner. 
that when I speak about research or when I'm inviting people to, to join my cohort, because I'm also running a program on coaching presence. And when we are, and I'm recruiting the cohort and I'm talking to people, it's always like, yeah, but the research and then the research. And then like, we can't research presence. And it's like, what, what philosophy is this? What mindset is this? Why should we not be able to, uh, to research presence? What, what openness is this to what we can do and what, what the potentials are out there? So I, I dare say that from what I know from recruiting cohorts and from, from talking to other practitioners, I would like to see more openness, the real openness, you know, that the way, the one that we practice towards our clients to, to allow research to show us its potential and inquire into, am I biased? Do I have prejudices? Do I hold assumptions about it that I could do without <laughs> to thrive? Mm, that question, are we, as curious about research as we are when we're curious with our clients is there's something almost parallel in there because it was making me think how curious are we when it comes to research compared to how curious we are about our clients and helping our clients to get curious about themselves Mm -hmm. because if if we as coaches are not role modeling, getting curious about how we do and be <laughs> as coaches, then where's our expansion for our clients? Yes, where's the expansion for our clients? And then to come back to like, where is the expansion to ourselves? Mm. Yeah, because like how are we expanding and creating spaces for us to grow away from the the usual ways of growing, like I am going to a webinar, I am taking yet another class on, I don't know what, what topic I am going to a conference, you know, all those row and, and read books and have conversations, have mentoring, supervision, et cetera. And to be curious about the potential, the power that research can do to, to be transformational for our lives. The way I was meaning to share about myself, how it was transformational just with a few examples. And there are a lot more. So how do we expand ourselves? Like what is the, the room and the space that we allow ourselves to really expand? And I, I totally understand that research is not for everyone because I also thought at the outset that research was not for me. I never knew that I would be able to, to do research because, oh, wow, that's, that's a different world. You know, you, ooh, that's up there, this is a, a sphere where you will data and this is dry and stuff. And I had my own assumptions about this. But when there was this moment of wake up, the waking up when I thought, oh, I would like to know more about presence because there's something happened in my practice. Yeah. Then I got so um, passionate and inspired that I forgot about my assumptions about coaching. Yeah. And I kind of like realized. And then I just was deep diving into the entire process and found out that I was actually a very good researcher. <laughs> so I could do away with my limiting belief about myself. And I could see, I could see the power that it was having and it can have not just for myself, but also for the field. And you know, I'm, I'm finding that I'm in my stump speech about my passion for coaching and, and coaching research. So just wanted to add that I think that it's also about us, like how we are caring about us, ourselves to expand. Yeah. Yeah. And it's making me think about if we've made a judgment or we've got a belief about ourselves, oh, I wouldn't be a good researcher, then where's our growth mindset that we need as a coach? So then there's, you know, the question about comes back, how curious are we about research? Or, But more to the point, how curious are we about ourselves and our capabilities? as as coaches and then as role models for our clients that we're prepared to step out into that vulnerable space and explore it and able to say yes this is great this is for me or maybe there is a no this isn't for me and, and that's okay and if I think about when you invited me to consider it I am a magpie that goes for shiny things and collects everything. So I say yes first and work it out later. (laughs) 
but in, and in my head thought, um, oh, I'll, I'll have this done in a few months. And, and here I am, three years into a project that's probably going to be at least four, already thinking about the strands that I still want to explore. And I haven't even finished this first piece yet because it opens you up to so many different areas. And as you say, people, you know, I think there's people from 30 different countries taking part in my research, which is exposed to different cultures as well. There was a question coming up for me when you were talking about bias in terms of maybe which pieces of research you may or may not be interested in. And this question may be quite vague, but we'll see what you make Mm -hmm. of it. Which pieces of research have you found most valuable that you've implemented into your practice? Mm. Mine, of course. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I know that was coming. <laughs> well, well, it's 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 true too, huh? Because I do like applying what we have found. Okay, so it's it should not just be some data that is discussed and found valuable, but it's not applicable. But actually, what I think of is, and and maybe people will not will not expect what I'm going to say now, but there is a lot of valuable research. There is absolutely valuable research out there about uh, Nikita Blanche. Uh, about AI in coaching, and I'm 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 naming it because AI is something that is all over the place today, touching coaches in different ways. Yeah, but actually, if we really take the time and and allow ourselves to be curious about what AI really means for coaching, there is research that has been done in a rigorous manner that could take away all our biases about AI. <laughs> so instead of falling into I don't know what sort of emotional states and minds, either too much enthusiasm or too little ex- enthusiasm or something in between, why not first find out like what the hell are we really talking about? What is it? What do we know and what do we still do not know before we fall for any hype or or get into anxious states of mind about this? Um or yeah, so that's number one. Number two is, and this is something that I'm I'm really practicing because I can practice it. It's called third generation coaching, uh, which deals with the fact that coaching as a field is evolving a lot and has evolved since its, let's say, its inception. So I'm uh, using the word inception with caution because so English is not my mother tongue. So whoever hears the word inception, it wasn't in, when, when it started coming coming up. So it was in the 90s, 19, 15, 1995, 1996. So since then, since the mid, mid, late 90s, and it was coming up, since then, coaching has evolved into, it has evolved with the world. Yeah. It has become a lot more complex than it used to be when it was more about goal attainment. And it was what um, Reinhard Stelter from Copenhagen University is calling the uh, first generation coaching when it was about uh, resolving a specific issue for a client, okay, and attaining a certain goal, be it around performance or other other issues. And then it was moving into into the phase, the second um, generation of coaching, when it's about, ah, we we were finding out how important the coach-client relationship, the so-called working alliance, is for the effectiveness of coaching until we started finding out 2005 2000 like um 2010 8 around this time that the relationship is moderating but not mediating the effectiveness of coaching which means i'm using the research jargon now moderating means it's contributing to success but it's not leading to it okay but we thought that that would be the one big key factor that would lead to success, whatever happens, whichever models we may using, methods we may using. So if the relationship, the working alliance would be okay, then everything would be okay. So it would lead to success. So it's a, we call it in research mediation. Now, moderation means that it's a contributing factor, but it's not the key factor. Yeah. It's not that A leads to B. It's, it's rather A via B leads to, leads to C. Yeah, so it's 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 this B factor that is contributing to C, to success and outcomes, but it's not directly leading to it. And now in third generation coaching, it's uh, and Reinhard Selter has researched it and has published about this. is all about being more a witness partner with the coachee, with the client, and not the witness partner. 
Okay, so not to be just a witness for the clients, but to be with the clients, to be with Nest clients as really fellow human companions. So this humanity coming forth a lot, that we are also just human beings and that client or coachee needs another human being to relate with them, which requires us to be more in a dialogical interactional mode with them rather than in a purely asking questions mode. Okay. And which also means we are more reflective with them. We are jointly meaning making, we are disrupting, we are looking for symmetry, asymmetry, all sorts of things in the relationship, in the topics, what the topics do for us, sharing it back. So it's more participatory than rather than we are this blank page. And then we are just having the questions for the clients for them to gain insights. So the transformational insights in third generation coaching, because the world of the clients has also become more complex, it requires that we are more in interaction with them by being with them rather than just witnessing them. So that's what I'm applying in my research a lot, in my practice a lot, sorry. Yeah. And so if I've understood correctly, it's um, going as close as we can to be in their shoes as we are with them and then sensing in to their experience and bringing in what's coming up for us as we are with them in that experience so that we can open them up to disrupt their thinking and mm. feeling patterns. Yeah. And if I may, if I may just add, yes, mm. and more. Sheila, and more and more. And also, actually, you said the word disrupt also more, like try to be with them, acknowledging that we may never be able to with them, but we are with them in the sense that we also meaning make and then we share it back so that we can bring in more richness. And if they ask for advice, for instance, we give advice. You know, this absolute no, no in coaching, the coaches don't give advice. Like who said that? <laughs> who is, who, if the client, if there's a client who asks for advice, we can also just be curious and say, okay, if you need advice, I may like to give advice. If that's really valuable for you, we can then ask. So in the first place, why would that advice be valuable for you? Okay. But then not withhold the advice. If they really want the advice, then give it. So to not be kind of like stuck in our own rigid uh, rules and regulations that date back to the, in the times of when coaching was, was born and was growing and acknowledge that we are a different generation and, and to allow ourselves to come in with the client more to be in their shoes too, but, and, and also be more. Yeah. And I just brought up this, this idea of the advice, because I know that this is a, a highly discussed topic, like advice or no advice or, and then which advice and how to deal with when clients are asking for advice. And so third generation coaching to be very practical would not discard giving advice. Okay. And would a lot, would discuss it. Like how come that advice is necessary? Of course. Yeah. To sensitize the client that is that really what they need? But not withholding it just because a school we learned at school, coaching school, that oh, you should not give advice. Like to get away from shoulds and, and see what is really relevant today in today's context with the client. Yes, and I, I agree that is potentially sort of a disruptive statement about it's okay to give advice, but we're not saying that in isolation. It sounds like yeah. you're saying it, there has to be this fronting up of what's driving you to ask for my advice what is it how is that going to be valuable for you because that conversation is going to support them to learn more about themselves than probably the advice that they actually receive if we do even get to the point where they're still saying yes i want your advice it's it would always from me particularly anyway it would come from well this is the world according to sheila and sheila's world is very different to your world i'm sure so here it is. But, and the, the example I usually use is for my well-being, I will go and throw myself in the sea in the middle of winter mm. without a wetsuit because it makes me feel incredible. But I, someone else to say, well, what, what would you advise for my well-being? And I will go <laughs> jump in the sea. And <laughs> people are the, the, the <laughs> And so usually once I've given that example, 
no one asks me for this anymore. Um, so yeah. it, it is very, it's very contextual, isn't it? But I think it's interesting as well about the different generations of coaching. And, you know, you mentioned the research by Nikki to Blanche, and I've, I've heard him talk about it, and it is fascinating research. But and if I've understood that research correctly, they've used an AI coach bot and found that it can match coaching from a human coach on a transactional level. Yes. But yet to prove itself on a transformational level. So yeah. coming back to your point about when we coaches take part in research and learn and go through that transformation ourselves, we can then put that into our coaching. And that is what we need to survive the mm-hmm. automation, essentially. What do you think about that? Yeah, and not just survive, Sheila. Thank you for bringing that up and, and also bridging it so nicely for us, the topic, because I, I really like how you're doing this. That not just to, to survive, but to thrive. There is no need to be afraid of anything if I know that I'm expanding myself and I'm, I'm growing. So why, why would I be afraid of anything? <laughs> like, why would I limit myself? Because it's, it's, it, no matter what comes, if I stay expansive and creative, and, and growing all the time because I'm staying open. And I promise that, that I, I, I always try to do as open as possible the way I'm, I'm practicing it with my clients for them to expand. So why be afraid? It does not exist in, in my, in my world. So, and I'm not sure if it's good. Uh, maybe I should be afraid. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but it's, it's sort of like, it's not my vocabulary to, to be honest. It's not my vocabulary. Mm. So. It was like a really, really juicy conversation. There's loads of questions that I've written that I've just abandoned. But what do you feel hasn't yet been said that still needs to be said? About what? About the, our, you know, our conversation about research, whether that's about research itself or us as coaches, practitioners. Mm, yeah, thank you for this. Thank you so much because, yes, there is something that I would like to add. Uh, I just briefly mentioned the knowledge bit, like that research has this aura of providing knowledge and being dry and brainy and stuff. And coaches seeing more the value in practical wisdom and experience. Like I was bringing the example that people were asking me, like, why would you measure presence? We cannot measure presence. And I said, like, and why should we not look into this? You know, why would stop me from, from trying? Because well, we shouldn't, because you can't measure it. And it's like, who said that? You know, like, what if you just, it takes the right approach to do it? And this is exactly what happened in my, in my research too. So I'm, I'm happy to bring up two more subjects just to contextualize and be a bit more structured because, um, for, for our audience to be able to follow. So I would like to add two more things. The one is the wisdom bit and the other one is what it means to do research. Okay. So I think that experiential wisdom has its unique place in our practice in, in our field. Just the way research has its very unique and legitimate place. Both have their legitimate places in our practice, but equally valuable. So I would like to inspire. I feel really excited about getting this out there to, to not prefer the one over the other, to not be trapped by preferences. Because I, I, I would like to say that maybe preferences keep us from being really present to what is relevant. If I just prefer to eat apples each day, my preference has a consequence on what I am looking for in a supermarket or at a market, apples only, and I'm not seeing the rest. So I am potentially limiting the way I'm seeing reality. And we are seeing the reality more fully is actually how we are earning our bread with coaching. So that's what I would like to yeah, mention here to the audience and to you as well. Like I think to not have preferences um, in terms of either either or, you know, either practical wisdom is more important because, and I'm coming to the second part, why, how transformational it was also for me to, and how inspiring it was for me to when I did not believe other people that we should not be researching presence because it is not measurable. And I said, wanna bet we can if we just look at it in the right way. And I remember that when I was, I was completed with a, the, the data collection phase, and it was about analyzing the data. And in research, of course, you have to do, you use standardized tools, validated tools, 
things that are normally used because that's how research needs to be done. And I perfectly respect that because research needs to be repeated, uh, reproducible, comparable. So there are standards that need to be put in place and, and respected. But when I found that the standard ways of uh, the standard analytical tools that we use to analyze the data that I was looking at, they were not compatible because the data didn't make sense. I thought, wow, what is this? But it did not keep me. I still didn't believe <laughs> those voices who said like, you can't measure presence. I thought, well, maybe it's just, I haven't found the right tool, analytical tool to take a look at the data. So I started having conversations with universities and I met somebody at Bern University in Switzerland, Fabian Hamzaya, who is a psychotherapist and is teaching at Bern University and has been researching what I was researching in coaching, like nonverbal synchrony to look at presence. And he has developed a validated tool, how to measure processes, like not just how to evaluate data that is taken at well, at the outset of a research and then data point at the, at the end of the research, but how to make sense of repeatedly collected data points, okay? So this is what we call uh, process research. You have several, at several times you collect data points, okay? And then you put it into, into context. And that takes a totally different approach than what has been used for other fields like in business management or in, in, in medicine or whatever. And when I found this and we together, so I got trained because I went to burn and I got trained in EAI. So the uh, motion and energy analysis, MEA. Yeah. So I was just going to say, let's clarify for the listeners actually, yeah. because it is quite a technical piece, but uh, you, yeah. ex you explain for the listeners. Yeah. yeah. yeah so th to, to learn about the tool and then to apply it, we were both actually surprised at the richness of what the data could show us and also found serendipity. And that's what I feel, I feel so much respect for in research, because to be honest, I went in with a certain assumption that, okay, so I'm going to show, this is how presence will show in the diets. But actually <laughs> what we found was so surprising. I could, I would never have expected those things. And that's what I think real research is when we can, when we reach that point of serendipity, you know, when we find what we were not meaning to find, because that's where we are building or creating. We are in the field of creation, you know, like in coaching, we are creating and co-creating. That's the power of creation of research. So research has the a similar, not same, but a similar power of creating things as coaching as an instrument has. And that's the fascinating thing, finding the serendipity by just being curious and not giving up because something doesn't work. And that's what I wanted to really share still, because I think this is important because that's what we tend to do wrong also. Like we start doing research and we go into this research with, I would like to prove, I have an assumption, a hypothesis, and I would, I would like to prove that this is right. Yeah. That's what we call unethical research, actually. <laughs> So it's not what we do. And norm there are also researchers who do that because they then want to market their products. Okay. So they want to prove that there is a research background to what they actually want to sell. But they, so that's not real research because when we do research, we go into something and we don't know what we are going to find. Yeah. And we are ready to meet serendipity. <laughs> and that was again, so enriching and, and humbling at the same time humbling me uh, in my relationship to research and humbling me in my relationship with my coaching practice. So, so the, the research bit absolutely informed my practice in that. Yeah, we'll make sure that we get some links to your research that come in the show notes following the session, because the thing that fascinated me about it was the technology that you used. So just to clarify for the listeners that as a participant in Tuno's research, I had to have a client who would agree to have our sessions video recorded, but it was movement only, so no audio. And then this technology, movement energy analysis, would map the body parts of coach and clients. And that's how the research looked at the synchronicity uh, between the two. And I think just useful to add that 
kind of explanation because that is how the presence was measured. But I'm sure there'll be people eager to get hold of that research <laughs> because it showed so much more, didn't it, about mm. the coaching process. Yeah, it, it did. Um, and so, maybe for, yeah. the, for the listeners, it might be important, like what is the practical essence of, of the findings? Maybe just very briefly is mm. what, was the, what was the serendipity about is that we found and we we didn't want to really believe it at first sight because I think like, that's this is not possible that maybe presence is not as important as we believe it is and not to the extent that we believe it is that when we are actually looking for synchrony between coach and client so not to go for it like this is the thing we we need the synchronicity because what we found through the analyzing the videotapes is that and then also conducting questionnaires and asking the the clients after each session is that clients don't always need the coach to be present. <laughs> and this is surprising. So they don't always need this, this, this perfect present moment and synchronicity. And sometimes coaches are just too present. <laughs> so we found like there is, it might sound absurd and maybe bizarre, but this is it. Like the, the research was showing that it's sometimes clients just want task focus. Okay. But we believe, because we learn, presence is the mastery skill, you know? We, we it's like, ah, we need to seek that synchronicity. And if not, like, whoa, the world is collapsing. No. So to be more in tune that presence is not about us coaches, which is what I learned when I was at coaching school. And I was at a very good one, Ashridge Business School. It's, the coaching presence is not about just a coach. It's not the coach's presence. It's a relational process within which we can dive in and out of presence, sometimes less, sometimes more. So it's this dancing in and out. It's not dancing, yeah? But it's dancing in and out of presence as is needed depending on several contextual requirements, be it the relationship, be it the, the room, the space that people are in, be it the larger cultural context, etc. So that was a serendipity bit about it. Like, what? Presence? Presence has got many facets? Wow, cool. Uh, I would never have expected this. Thank you so much for sharing so generously today. I'm sure there'll be listeners who want you to be a bit more present in their lives. So where can people find you? Where's the best place to get in touch with you? Like I do have a website. The website is www.tundeerdos.com. T-U-E-N-D-E-E-R-D-O-E-S.com. But people can also find me on LinkedIn. So they type in my name or YouTube. So, or, and, and like I, I do have a very good presence on social media, although I'm disconnecting with it because it's not, uh, yeah, I'm, you know, diving in and out of it again. So, like the balance, way, balance it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm definitely, people can definitely find me. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. And yeah, I really, really appreciate this conversation. And I hope the listeners have found it inspiring too. I certainly have learned even more about you than I already knew, even though I've known <laughs> you for a good six years. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Maybe, maybe just one thing, Sheila, maybe we can, mm. we can mention the, the book, yes. the Coaching Science Practitioner Handbook, which is a collection of coaches' experiences have read it cover to cover and it's the first book I've ever taken a pencil to <laughs> and written in because there was so much to learn from it. Yeah so I would like to mention this book because after I was finished with my research I invited a few coaches and a few of their clients if they would like to talk about their experience like what in what way it was inspirational to participate in the research and because today we are talking about excitement and inspiring other people to conduct research and especially coaches to conduct research is this book is a collection of some of the coaches transformational experience through research so if somebody would like to go and and find out more like how transformational research and inspiring research can be I think rather than find me somewhere, <laughs> I think it, it may be more valuable for them to to read the book because, with the book, you would they would also contribute to your research because this book and all the all the money that we collect through the sales is is supporting your research. Okay, and I wanted to mention yes. this that this is um, a non for profit thing, and it's to to fund research for people like you, practitioner researchers who are inspired to make a contribution to the field. Yeah, and it does give multiple people's perspectives of taking part in research. So I think that's yeah, the yeah. 
the brilliant thing about it it's not just one person's experience so yeah. thank you for bringing that in as well Tinder. it was my pleasure thank you for caring to invite me thank you thank you thank you for listening to another podcast by the association for coaching for over 20 years our purpose has been to inspire and champion coaching excellence advance the coaching profession and to make a sustainable difference to individuals organizations and society to find out more about the AC and our member benefits, follow us on LinkedIn or visit our webpage at associationforcoaching.com. Explore our digital learning hub, enjoy our extensive library of on-demand webinars, signature programs, member benefits, interviews, podcasts, and a portfolio of live events featuring thought leadership, tools, models, and the latest industry trends to help you develop your coaching expertise.